Probably the most common application of conservation of momentum will come between impacts between two or more particles, or two or more objects. It doesn't even have to be particles. And it doesn't even have to be a physical contact of when we talk about impacts. If you've ever heard of the slingshot effect, this is an effect where we use the gravitational pull of one object to cause a satellite to slingshot around it, in other words, to go around it and to pick up speed in so doing. That's actually an impact between the satellite and the planet or the moon. But the planet doesn't actually make physical contact with the satellite. It's a gravitational impact. But momentum is conserved nonetheless. Another example of a, quote, impact would be a nuclear particle that decays into two or three subparticles, spontaneous decay. The momentum of the particle before the decay and the momentum of the particles, plural, after the decay are the same. Conservation of momentum still holds true. But we're going to stick with just simple impacts between two or three particles, generally in one or two dimensions, although the rules still hold in more than one dimension. Now the idea is I take a surface and I have two objects on that surface and the objects will collide somewhere in between. And what happens is if I label this A and this B, particle B will exert a force on particle A. I'll call that B on A. And particle A will exert a force on B. I'll call that FAB. But Newton's third law tells us that these two forces are equal in magnitude opposite in direction. And so if I look at the integral of F dt on the system, this will equal the integral of F A B dt plus the integral of F B A dt. That's the impulse on particle A, the impulse on particle B. But this will equal the integral of F A B plus F B A. You know that from calculus. The sum of two integrals is equal to the integral of the sum dt. But FAB and FBA are equal and opposite, so this is equal to zero. And since the forces then are internal to the system, where the system includes particle A and particle B, there is no impulse. And so the momentum of the system, which is the mass of A times the velocity of A, plus the mass of B times the velocity of B, that's the momentum previous to the impact. That must equal the mass of A. And for after the impact, I'm going to use the letter U instead of v prime, but v prime is the same thing, so u equals v prime. They're the same thing. The book will use v prime, I prefer to use a u, plus the mass of b times u b. Now, I am not saying the momentum of a is the same before and after, and the momentum of b is the same before and after, although that is possible. What I am saying is the total momentum, a plus b, before the impact equals the total momentum, A plus B, after the impact. That's conservation of momentum. All right, there are two types of impacts that we're going to look at. And in this particular lecture, we're looking at direct central impacts. And you can see by the definition here, what that means is the line of impact, which I'll explain in just a moment, coincides with the velocities. And so here's two spheres. And both of the spheres are moving towards each other in such a fashion that their velocities create a single line. So the point of impact between these two spheres is right there. Now, there's a line mutually tangent to those two surfaces. I'll write that out in green. That line is tangent to the two surfaces. The line of impact will be perpendicular to that tangent line. So the purple line is the line of impact. And these two lines are at 90 degrees. And what you'll see here is that the velocities, here's the velocity of A and here's the velocity of B, the velocities are along that line of impact. Now for different shapes, the line of impact will be in different directions. And we'll look more at that in the next lecture on oblique impacts. But for direct central impacts, the line of impact is along the velocities. And one of the things that's really important about this is that the problem is basically one-dimensional. We're only going to worry about what's going on along the line created by the velocity. So that can be our x-axis or our y-axis, however you want to look at that. But in this case, we'll call that maybe the x-axis because that will be how things are taking place. Well, let's start with uh, some equations then that go along with direct central impact. Since it's one-dimensional, I can ignore the vector aspect 
of my velocity. However, I do have to be careful of the sign. So V can be positive or negative, and that's going to be important. So be careful of the sign, S-I-G-N, sign of those velocities. So the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. And there can be more than two particles here. Another thing to keep in mind is this ratio here. This is the velocities after the impact, and here are the velocities before the impact. Notice the subscripts. It's particle B minus particle A after the impact, and particle A minus particle B before the impact, those velocities. This ratio, UB minus UA, over VA minus VB, and of course you can switch your A's and B's and you'll get the same number. This equals E, which we call the coefficient of restitution. And so it's a characteristic of a variety of different kinds of materials as they impact with each other. In the case of a perfectly plastic collision, in this case E is equal to zero. Now if we go back to the definition of E, if E is equal to zero, then UB minus UA is equal to zero. How can UB minus UA equal zero only if UB equals UA? So that means after the impact, particle B equals particle A in velocity. So that means the two particles are stuck together. E is equal to one. Kinetic energy is conserved. So the total kinetic energy before the collision will equal the total en kinetic energy after the collision. One interesting thing about a perfectly elastic collision is that that collision cannot cause any noise to take place. Because if noise is created, that means energy was used to create that noise, and that energy has to come from the particle. So two objects can't make physical contact without making noise. And so a perfectly elastic collision in the real world can't involve an actual contact. Now what can create a perfectly elastic collision is like a magnetic collision where the two particles don't actually touch each other and yet they interact and collide. And we do that a lot in physics with experiments. One thing I should point out, in order for momentum to be conserved, there can be no external forces. So if I go back to this whole concept back in here, the integral of F dt has to be zero. Well, here I have an internal force and an internal force. There can be no external forces or else the momentum can change. So gravity cannot come into play here. It's got to be countered by a normal force. Uh, there can't be any friction, at least none to speak of within the collision. No external forces can come into play or momentum will not be conserved. So here's an example. I have two steel blocks. There's no friction on the horizontal surface. Immediately before the impacts, their velocities are given here. And we know the coefficient of restitution is 0.75. We're interested in the velocities after the impact. So I start off using momentum conservation. And I would get 0.6 kilograms times 4 meters per second plus 0.9 kilograms times 2 meters per second. That's going to be equal to the momentum before. And that should equal the momentum after the collision, which is 0.6 kilograms times u sub a plus 0.9 kilograms times u sub b. And I better correct something here. 2 meters per second is to the left, so that's negative 2 meters per second. But what you'll notice here is I have two unknowns, ua and ub. So I need another equation. That equation comes from the coefficient of restitution. e, which is equal to 0.75, must equal ub minus ua over VA, which is 4 meters per second, minus a minus 2 meters per second, which is UB minus UA over 6 meters per second. And so now I have two equations and two unknowns. So let's set these up. So before the collision, I have 2.4 kilogram meters per second minus 1.8 kilogram meters per second. So that's 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second. So 0 0.6 kilogram meters per second equals 0 0.6 kilogram UA plus 0 0.9 kilograms UB. You notice I don't know anything about the sign of UA and UB, so I assume that they're both positive. 
and when I solve my problem, if it's going to the left, as one of them certainly will be, it'll come out as negative. So I don't worry about what the sign is. It'll work its way out. I'm going to reduce this by dividing both sides by 0.6 kilograms. And when I do that, I'm going to get 1 meter per second equals UA plus 1.5 UB. The coefficient of restitution, I had 6 meters per second in the denominator. That's equal to 0 0.75 is the coefficient of restitution. So I'm bringing that 6 meters per second over the other side. And that's equal to UB minus UA. So UB minus UA equals 4.5 meters per second. And this top equation is 1.5 UB plus UA equals 1 meter per second. If I add these two equations together, 2.5 UB equals 5.5 meters per second. So UB equals 5.5 over 2.5 meters per second, which is 2.2 meters per second. And if UB is 2.2 meters per second, UB minus 4.5 meters per second equals UA. That's from this equation right here. And so UA equals 2.2 meters per second minus 4.5 meters per second, which is minus 2.3 meters per and so in fact that is moving to the left a has bounced back the other direction the problem always also asks me for the loss of kinetic energy so my kinetic energy is one half 0 0.6 kilograms times four meters per second squared plus one half 0 0.9 kilograms times negative two meters per second quantity squared so notice the negative sign is going to go away so i need to worry about that and that's 6.6 .6 joules and then after the collision I have one half 0. 0.6 kilogram negative 2.3 meters per second squared plus one half 0. 0.9 kilograms 2.2 meters per second squared which is 3.765 joules and so I have a loss okay so I started with 6.6 .6 joules now I have 3.765 2.835 joules